Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is a repeat guest from three weeks ago. He's been in surveillance for a long time. Recently, he's retired. We'll call him Junior. Junior, welcome back to Gambling with an Edge. Thank you. Often, using cameras, or rather, how often, using cameras, does a casino follow a patron out to the parking lot to get the license number of his car? Ah. Uh. Hopefully not that often at all. Um, we had at one point installed something called a license plate recognition system. And some of the more aggressive people probably did follow someone out to get the car. However, a lot of people will get rental cars. So we'd put a license plate number in there that would trigger every time and it would never be the person that they put in there. Second, we expanded the license plate recognition to other departments who would put a license plate in with no description at all of why that license plate was in there. So we'd get a trigger and have no idea who had just arrived on property. Eventually, the amount of data that got in there was absolutely worthless. And uh, it, definitely not at the last place I worked was it even used. Um, Aria had it. I don't know how much emphasis they still put into it. But really... Especially if it's just a card counter or a, a cheat, maybe. You know, someone who had stolen from somebody definitely would do the extra legwork. But for a simple advantage play, yeah, I didn't think it was worth the effort. If that happened, like say it was a cheat and you put the license plate in, if that car showed up in the lot, would it alert somebody? Yeah, if you put it in the LPR, you drive past a camera on the entry way into the parking garage and it'd pick up the license plate number and it'd, it'd alert that this car had arrived. And then unfortunately you needed the data to tell you something once that alert came up. Instead, all you had was this license plate arrived. You would then have to search what did that license plate mean to me? And if it wasn't say in a person's subject file, you had no one to match them up to. If there were no notes there, you just had an alert that went off and oh great, this car is here. <laughs> um, a lot of times, I mean, they would throw they would throw everybody in there. Uh, security department would throw hookers in there, um, uh, undesirables, slot checkers. If they had a car, they were thrown in there. And slot checkers, yeah, and the ones that go around looking for abandoned credits and picking up Tito's left at machines and cashing them out and then departing property onto the next place to do the same thing. Everybody would go in there and eventually became useless. All right. Next question. If someone who doesn't have heat and isn't rat holing he colors up for 20000 and immediately leaves the property without cashing out and surveillance notices this, can this in and of itself heat them up? Depending on where you're at. Um, some of the higher end places, I maybe a little mental note of it departed with 20k in checks it's definitely going in the rating uh, they'll put it in the rating that they have 20k in, in large denomination checks and if it's an unknown they generally won't give them the larger denominations because they're difficult to cash so they'll give her small give them smaller denomination checks you know yellow say one thousand dollar checks rather than five thousand dollar checks not immediately it's it's it all depends um you know, there would have to be more to the story that would immediately heat that person up than simply walking with a large amount of checks, especially when you've done this for a while. You see some astronomical wins that are just unreal, and it's just par for the course. Sometimes it happens. If you have a person of interest and you see him throw something into the trash, will surveillance ever go through the trash to attempt to identify who that person was and what they were throwing away. It would take a lot to dig through the trash. Um, only one instance uh, where I thought someone was using a device and I offered to write up my resignation if I could run down and steal this patron's hat and just run right by him, snag his hat and take off. Uh, but I was not allowed to do that. That would be the only instance if I thought he threw something illegal away that was evidence that would be used, and it, it would have to be cheating. I'm not going after a card counter's trash or a whole carter's trash or, you know, even the most sophisticated ace tracker. I'm not digging through his trash. The, the play is pretty obvious. What, what kind of play did you think was going on with the hat? You fascinated me here. I believe they were sequencing a continuous shuffler. 
the play would start relatively timid for a few earlier in the day. No hat, all six spots at 25. Then the player would go upstairs and come down a few hours later, and every time he started to actually play to something, he had the hat on. It would be six hands at 25 with occasionally a four or $8,000 bet out there. And what I had to do was take a ton of hands and correlate his big bets to aces and tens. And he was 80% accurate. I remember this. He was 80% accurate on bets of 8,000 or larger and 100% accurate on bets of 10K. And every time he had to go grab that hat. So I wanted that hat. That was really the only <laughs> difference. And I offered my boss. I said, look, I'll write up my letter of resignation. Just let me run through the pit and just snake his hat and just see what's in there. And he wouldn't let me do it. So instead, what we did is we put a, um, a strip riffle into the in-between when the deck went back into the continuous shuffler. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing on video because he came again. And he sat down and was playing his normal all spots at $25. And out comes this riffle strip or strip riffle, whatever order it was in. And everything stopped. And he got up from the table and looked down the whole pit. And every table's doing the riffle strip before putting it back in the shuffler. And he walked away. And never played that game again. So I was pretty convinced he was probably sequencing. Um... I'm just wondering what would be in the <laughs> what would be in the hat, you know? I don't know. Maybe it helped them focus because it took me a while. There's a term I can't say, but someone said they were intently staring at the shuffle machine. And actually it was weeks later I was on vacation when it finally occurred to me why they may be staring so hard at the shuffle machine to know when the next pack of cards was loaded, it would slightly move the card that was ready to be delivered when the next pack was set to be was loaded to be delivered behind it well that would make sense for staring intently at it because if you wanted to know when your pack was coming out you know, you'd have to feel the vibration of the machine as it spun know your pack was lined up and see that the front card had been slightly dislodged and knew your next pack was coming out but other than that you know the number the number of them he was able to keep track of it was was quite amazing well, you've already said you aren't going to go through a player's trash. Are there yes. any other strange ways surveillance will attempt to identify a person of interest? Not myself, but there is a group that goes through Google and gets your, or not Google, sorry, Facebook, and gets your fantastically great photos from there. Um, most of uh, the best advantage players, we know who they are. Uh, we don't know that they're an advantage player. They're a regular player, and they're getting something on. And those those are really the best ones to go after. Your typical advantage player, who's you know either you know most of what you see is hole carding or uh, card counting, they're not truly truly damaging. You know, they're fairly simple to spot, and you just stop the play. There's nothing more to it than that. We had a group that uh, that. Don't know if I mentioned this last week. Cut the back card of a shoe into play, steered it to their hand, and we knew who they were. They were rated as well. We just at our place we put a second cut card into the uh, into the shoe, so that they couldn't see the back card. Only on their game, and they got the hint. At another place, uh, they just straight up banned them, said you can't play anymore blackjack, and that was it for that. Uh, it takes something extraordinary to go to bigger lengths than just simply you know, figuring out the play, shutting it down. And you know. What about um, reading their texts? I mean, a lot of players are very, ter uh, very paranoid about, you know, letting the screen of their phone be seen by the camera above. And You will have some that will zoom in on your texts, uh, whether or not you're an advantage player, just because it's there and we can see it. And uh, maybe not a lot has happened in a while, and we're kind of bored. Um, <laughs> looking at text is better than looking at cleavage when you're bored? Oh, see, we look at cleavage, we get in trouble. That was a big, big case in Atlantic City of surveillance officers. One of the first things you get when you come into the, into the building is, yeah, you don't look at cleavage. Uh, waitresses filed suit against the surveillance room in Atlantic City. I forget which property, well before I got into surveillance. Wow. Because, yeah, they were stalking them with the cameras. Yeah, that's a big no-no. 
Because, yeah, George Joseph wrote that book, um, uh, Why why Women Shouldn't Wear Red Dresses in Casinos. or it, It's got some weird title like that. And, um, oh, yeah. But, but you know, he wrote that book, I don't know, 25 years ago or something. And, um, you know, surveillance was a lot different back then. And a lot of time was spent looking at cleavage, I guess. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that's one of the cardinal sins. There are two cardinal sins in a surveillance room. You don't fall asleep and you don't, you don't zoom in on, on anatomy parts, male or female. <laughs> Does surveillance have access to ID scanners at entrances that security uses to confirm age. I have not worked at one that scans at the entrance, but we do have access to the ID scanners that are used at the cage to verify ID. I have seen flyers sent out where they've gotten the identification off the person from one of the choke po- or checkpoints where they check your ID as you enter the property. So I would assume that, yes, they do. I can't guarantee that for all of them, but I would guess that they probably do. Okay. Here's a rather long question from one of our listeners. A well-known author wrote that from a player's perspective, the causes of heat are, in order of importance, one, recognition on sight, two, heated up by name or identity, three, big session or lifetime win, four, unusual betting, particularly bet variation, five, unusual playing strategy from your experience as the eye would you agree with that order when it comes to danger to the player for the most part yeah i mean if you're if you're known or we've been tipped off that you're someone that we should look at then of course that's going to generate heat quickest um if you've proven to be a big lifetime winner uh this is unfortunate but there is a a data um data mining program that pulls up what are the you know called the let's say the winningest players of the past year and submits their names and if they're showing up however this is the unfortunate part of this i only saw that form twice in five years that it was available so while they knew we had these players that are winning above expectation it didn't trickle down to us on the front then one of the two times it did trickle down, uh, somebody put warnings in to notify surveillance if in play. And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If the reason for their win has something to do with some form of collusion between other people on property, they're going to see this notify surveillance trigger when they pull this guy's account up and whatever was happening is done. We, we, we can't put those in there. You know, especially we just you know, make a note. We want to take a look at this person when they land, but don't let anybody else know it. Uh, so, yeah, the lifetime win will eventually show up. I or someone else will run through a standard deviation check. If it's approaching three standard deviations, we're going to take a look at the play. Possibly harder if we've looked at it before and they still continue to win. Uh, I would assume that what they're playing would have bearing on that, too. Like if they're... a uh craps player or uh you know yeah craps is actually phenomenally high variance i was surprised when i ran it how high the variance can go on craps you can be winning pretty big and it's nothing unusual or losing pretty big um although yeah definitely with especially what's gone on in craps at the last place i worked they should be paying a little bit more attention to that game uh do you want to tell us a little bit about that uh before my time but apparently there was a crew, this is all on the news and in the media, there were two dealers that were bringing in a third associate to play while they were the two dealers on the game, and uh, they would have phantom bets, late bets that were getting paid off. The dump was so bad, they would pay the full price and press the full amount onto the bet that they just paid that wasn't there before the roll started. Um... And a lot of this, you'd have to attribute to the fact that there aren't box men anymore, right? Right. They would specifically wait. This is, again, I wasn't there to see it, but the little snippets of video, it appeared that they waited until the box person or the floor person was no longer paying attention to the game. And then it was all out straight. Braz and theft. Um, Checks would be thrown into the middle, into into the come box, and they would be booked after the outcome of the dice were rolled. 
Uh, you'd have checks thrown into the uh, hop area that weren't booked until the outcome was known. And then, again, there would be the dump-off straight from the stack to the rail, the dump-off oh, in wow. the payoff. Oh, it was, <laughs> it, was, it was atrocious. And that's just a small amount of video that I saw and all that. But their play was particular in that it had to be the two dealers and it had to be the third person in there. So from, again, not firsthand experience, there was a tip-off long before it got caught. But from what I understand is the three pieces didn't all come together. They looked at each, in, each dealer individually, but not at the same time. And then looked at the player not playing in the correct situation with the two other dealers. I remember hearing, oh, this is going back... I don't know, I want to say 15 years ago or, or more, that MGM had um, bought a software that would compare... Basically, you could plug in, say, a dealer's name and a player's name, and it would tell you if there was some connection between those two people. Oh, 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 what is it? Non-obvious relationships? Something like that, yeah. I never saw it. I heard rumors of it. Now, that would require a connection on, say, something like Facebook or social media. Or, or, or that they're related in some way, or, like they're cousins. Yeah, or next-door neighbors or, yeah. or something. I'm sure uh, I've heard of it. I never saw it myself, never saw it in use. Uh, we have the capability although the company elected not to do this and i would have loved to have had it where the dealer will log himself into a game so that we could track a dealer from table to table to table and also how often a certain player plays with that dealer although they elected not to have that part of the software package installed which would have been great for data mining that seems odd i mean that's what i mean if i ran the circus my favorite dr seuss book um you know i always thought why not have the dealer stay on the same table so that you can get data on, is this dealer not holding what they should be? Yeah, it's especially that. Or if, you know, a player always plays with the same dealer. We, uh, we at one point had a dealer had a player on the game, an associate or family member, I'm not sure which, and afterward met that player in the employee parking garage. Well... Someone else saw them, another dealer, realized that this dealer was dealing to this player earlier, and now they're in their parking garage. So they tipped off someone in table games who went and tipped us, tipped us off to take a look at it. And uh, in, the, uh, in the initial write-up was the famous line, nothing suspicious observed. <laughs> there was no mention of whether the player won or lost. There was no mention of whether this was a blackjack game, whether he played perfect basic strategy, whether he could have possibly had a whole card. There was no mention of were there any payout errors. You know, uh, there was no mention, just nothing suspicious observed. So I, this is, before I calmed down quite a bit, I got a little bit kind of testy, and I wrote up on the big chalkboard, or not a chalkboard, whiteboard in our room, what to look for if possible dealer agent collusion and listed <laughs> the several the things. Lot. Yes. <laughs> he said, nothing suspicious does not cut it. But um, I, I remember when I broke in at the Golden Nugget, I remember walking through the pit on the way to the break, and there was a dealer from Thailand dealing double deck, and there was a woman on the table also from Thailand, and they were had this nonstop conversation going on in Thai. And I thought, wow, that you know, I don't think I'd let that go on if I was the boss. <laughs> the boss. I mean, I'm sure it was uh, innocent, but still. Uh, but you're not sure. Nobody, no. yeah, nobody else understands what they're saying to each other. It'll all show up in the play. Yeah. yeah. Are, are there any particular busts that you're proudest of? I've been fortunate enough to have a few, but I'm going to go with my funnest. Because this the funnest will good yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. This, that'll be good this 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 play now just magnify this further out this was a two person play and it was it was really really good and that it went on for a while um, one person had a loss rebate deal in place the other person had a deal in place where they got a portion of their theoretical back this was on Baccarat. The first person would take out call bets of the max, 
for the second person. If that call bet won, the money went to the second person and was paid back, thereby wow. inflating their average wager for the second person. If the call bet lost, the marker was issued to him and taken as a loss. So they were able to simultaneously inflate the loss of the first person while inflating the average bet of the second person by call betting to the max and absolutely crushing it with the rebates. Additionally, all of the commission was paid off by the person trying to inflate his loss. Now, it was nabbed because it was these two people all the time. So, okay, what's going on? And then he started to put it together. We can see, uh, we can see um, the loss rebate disbursement in, in the, the scroll down under the comps that this person has received. There are several that we can't see, which add more to the edge of this. Say, for instance, you do suffer a significant loss. You also get a discount if you pay up immediately and settle that. So that adds to the edge. That's not visible. I don't know how much of a discount is offered to who. Well, so surveillance, well, we don't see. Often there's show up money. Is that? Yes. It? Yes. You get that. You get that up front. Um, <laughs> promo checks or whatever other disbursement they give you to show up. Now, this play was fun because oh, I had to show how much money got moved from one person to the other person and how they inflated their loss on this side and inflated the average bet over what it was on this side and how much had moved. And then just imagine if instead of just two people, this was a six-person crew doing this, you know, with half of them with a nice, juicy little loss rebate going on and half of them doing the other thing or any variation thereof. Now, I'm sure this is still happening around town. It was, it was, it was a fun play to put together. On... Loss rebate. Is it surveillance's job to check to see if the player is rat holing to inflate his losses? Uh, well, um, if you're playing big enough to qualify, you're generally the only person there at the table. Did have another the same the same situation? This was absolutely ridiculous. It was uh, this was four people, but they ran in the little two man groups. One would introduce checks to the game, while the other pulled checks off the game. The only problem was is that their ratings were exactly opposite each other. At the same time, one would have a 17K win while the other one had a 17K loss with an average bet of $150. I mean, that's, that's, a bad, that's a bad, bad run or a good run from the other side. So that one was fairly obvious to pick up in that one was pulling them off at the same time his partner was bringing them on to the game. And they were going after the loss rebates that way by inflating losses above and beyond. Generally, it's not our deal to look for rat holing. Um, we will look for it on the smaller games where you can actually hide checks. It is a question that they ask, was the player rat holing? But in the bigger games where you qualify for a loss rebate, you're generally the only person at the table, one of a handful of people. You're generally the largest better, and it's kind of hard to hide. You tell us you've retired from working surveillance. Do you see any chance you'll return to the job? in that area well not as a frontline definitely not as a frontline i've made a commitment um that's you know i wanted to meet mr munchkin for a long time and he shot me down which many many people <laughs> do and now that i have no i don't ever want to be put in the position of having to say do you know this person no <laughs> no so that's that's out that probably also precludes a lot of other positions within uh, surveillance in general. That probably also kills any floor supervisor position. Um, poker dealer. That seems like a nice little, I mean, I'm sure poker dealers are listening to it and just going, don't, it sucks, or, or no, it's, it's not all that it's cracked up to be. But um, you, know, you get your cards thrown at you by irate poker players. Uh, you have to keep a straight face while everyone's being mean, but that would be something that yeah, I can go back in for that. Uh, valet is way too hot out here. I'm not doing valet. <laughs> um, some type of uh, position where, uh, yeah, I'm not put into the into the ethical dilemma of having to identify somebody that I've met since leaving there. Uh, maybe say uh, training other operators, you know, where I'm not even involved in studying film or, or analyzing a specific person. But I could see that would be interesting i but i would also say um you know i mean i'm retired too but even if i wasn't and you did go back i mean i wouldn't 
want to put you in that awkward position. So assuming I knew where you were and what shift, I would just <laughs> avoid going in when you're there. You know, I mean. it's It's been two weeks since I left. And it's a good two weeks to get my head clear. You know, we worked entirely through the pandemic. So there wasn't a little break that a lot of places did get or even my coworkers did get. Uh, now, a lot of stress, obviously, over the last 18 months with everything else that's going on. I'm looking into work from home. Sadly, the income is not irreplaceable. Uh, it's not so much that you absolutely can't. If any other job in the casino, you're probably doing better. Um, <laughs> Cocktail waitress. Yes. <laughs> the man with $100,000 breasts. Yeah. <laughs> He's actually been a guest on our show a couple of times. Uh, back in the day, uh, it said that Ken Houston was once busted by surveillance somewhere. Because he always wore the same ring, and some surveillance guy recognized that ring. Do you pay attention to jewelry or watches of suspicious people? At times, if you've got uh, if you've got a lot of close things that are similar in between two, you know, or a grainy picture, and you're going off, you know, you're looking for anything else. Uh, he's got the same hat, but let's say it's a, a Vegas Golden Knights hat. Jesus, everybody's wearing a Vegas Golden Knights hat. Okay, that doesn't help. But if he's got a um, you know, a very obvious ring on in one photo, and you see the guy sitting there, we'll use it as helpful in identifying them. But um, they won't be the main thing that we look for when somebody, or that I look for. Other people have other... It's the ears, roles. Bob. The ears. Yes. <laughs> it's the earring, not the watch. <laughs> Cheating at poker, where players steal chips from other players... Uh, one player asked the question, he said, the casino took no responsibility for the losses. The best they did was say they would look for the thief if he ever returned. Um, is that standard for casinos? Sadly for poker, yeah, it pretty much is. Um, I don't know the poker room's operating budget, but I imagine that they don't have a lot left over after everything. Uh, in slots, if you get some fun stolen from you. It's really what type of player and up to the slot personnel there as to whether or not they'll award you free play or just tell you sorry. Uh, in poker, yeah, there's uh, we will identify the person if we can. We will get good ID shots if we can of the person who stole the checks. We will save all of the video coverage, but it is up to the victim to go to either gaming or uh, the police department, file a report and press charges on their own. If the person is still there, we will detain them and then, you know, have police show up, show them the video evidence. And again, it's up to the person, the victim to press charges. The casino itself can't press charges. And not often is the poker room itself going to make the person whole uh, based on someone else's theft. Now, if the poker room does an error, say um, you throw a hundred dollar check into the pot to get change and you never got your change and we're at fault and we've shorted you we'll we'll make you whole off of that but theft from between players uh, we'll do what we can would a uh would a known player who has stolen from another player be barred from ever playing poker there again or is that a forgivable sin that depends on a lot of things <laughs> um if the person wants to press charges if he gave the funds back i uh, did it look like straight up theft or was it a check that was stuck in the, between two players and one person took it and it didn't end up belonging to him. There's a lot that goes into that. Uh, there are a few well known in the poker world that are no longer in the room who are just either angle shooters, shot takers or whatever. They've decided they don't want to deal with them anymore. Anytime you're accused of and there's some type of evidence of collusion between two players, only once have I done an analysis of this. Uh, both those players were gone. No questions asked. They didn't want that in the room. So uh, that answers it in a little bit more, I think. If any of our listeners wanted to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Okay. I put together. Thankfully, it's easy to create a Gmail account. Um, it gave me JJR. G W A E at gmail.com. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, it's uh, no. 
I'll answer what I can without getting myself into any legal trouble. <laughs> um, prefer not to get in legal trouble. The software that the casinos use, is it able to analyze players playing blackjack variants? At the moment, no. Um, it Not even Spanish? Not that we have. We don't have Spanish 21. No place I've worked is Spanish 21. Oh. And I bought Miss Walker's book thinking that I was going to a place that had it. Um, but not that I know of. There may be add-ons that you could do. We don't have it. Uh, definitely, it's not going to catch free bet. Uh, my ultimate dream of whole carding blackjack switch. Uh, won't get that. Um, now what other variants do we have out there? The only thing it does is basic, uh, you can do six to five blackjack, but why we want to run a survey on someone doing six to five blackjack? I don't know. And since I don't know, I'm going to have, take a few minutes for commercials and we'll be back with Junior momentarily. South Point has more than 10,000 games returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In July, free play with a kicker promotion is in effect for those players who already get mailers. Pick up your normal mailer free play Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And if you do, you'll receive the same amount of free play on Friday or Saturday of the same week. Pick up all eight free plays for the four weeks of the promotion, and you'll receive a double amount of free play on Monday, August 2nd. Hey guys, this is Colin from blackjackapprenticeship.com. And if you're serious about card counting, I'd encourage you to check out the Blackjack Apprenticeship membership. It has the training tools you'll need to beat the game, like our comprehensive video course and our training suite, so you can learn each skill and virtually test yourself before ever stepping foot in a casino. It also includes the tools you'll need to succeed, like our pro betting software, casino database, results tracking software, and access to a community of like-minded advantage players to network with in our members forum and chat room software. You can find out more at blackjackapprenticeship.com. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Peak and Play Poker. This is a seven coins per line game where you get to see the first card off of the pack of 47 cards. That is your dealt five, there's still 47 there, but you know the first card coming. You must take that card, assuming you don't hold all five original ones. Let's say you're dealt ace, king, queen, jack of spades, and a red four. In normal video poker, you hold all four spades, say a prayer and hope for the royal. But if the card coming is another ace, you know you're not going to get the royal. So you hold the ace you have, start your hand with two aces, and hope for the best. You'll have to work out the strategy on your own. All right, we are back talking with surveillance expert Junior. We're curious about your experience with Biometrica, assuming you're used to it. How often was it used? How many people had access to it? How accurate was it? And did they still make their own determination afterwards, etc.? The place I broke in at had either Biometrica or another one. I don't remember. I think there was one other facial recognition software or database with faces. Um, they used it infrequently. Everywhere since then, we haven't used it at all. In fact where I broke into town at the Mirage, if you quoted Griffin as the source of your reason for taking action, you were ostracized. We did not take any action based on a database. We evaluated our own. Wow. So not even, uh, what about uh, OSN? Um, I know some people have access to it. It's not in our department. It's not a program that's installed on anybody's computer in every department. Well, it's some just people a website. Still have, it's yeah. not even a program. So, so basically, you're only using your own internal database. They, they, yes. yes. Oh, okay. And in fact, uh, depending on where that um, positive evaluation comes from, we reevaluate. Um, so if, say, even if it's 
you know, say Venetian or Wynn there, and they say, hey, they backed this guy off over there, we're still going to do our own evaluation in-house. But the fact that you knew that you know that it is in Griffin is sufficient reason for you to do an evaluation. It wouldn't be if I'd ever looked at Griffin. I haven't looked at Griffin in 14 years, and definitely none of the other databases in my entire time in Vegas. Um, if the person showed up in Tahoe as a person being in the database, I don't recall precisely what action they take or whether they just evaluated the person there. Uh, again, some still have passwords and logons to, especially OSN, I'm assuming Biometrica. They probably go through that and make their own determinations. It's not anybody that I've worked with recently. So obviously you don't contribute to OSN then either. Not, not myself. I don't know if on a corporate level someone may decide to push through some of this information, but definitely I'm not adding anybody to that. Um, uh, what, ab what about, you know, there are a lot of MGM properties and uh, they're not all created equal. Yes. Were there some places where if you saw the report from a particular casino, you sort of roll your eyes and go, oh, yeah, they're paranoid about everybody who you know, raises their bet from one to two, so I want to do my own evaluation? I'm sure from the flip side of this, you know, from the player side, it seems that we, we probably have a few places they call sweatshops. Uh, it doesn't appear that we have a ton of those from what we're seeing. <laughs> Some places have more card counters on average than others. Uh, they heavily, heavily focus on that. In fact, I know of one person who suggested that we should BJ survey everybody on the property. I wasn't there, <laughs> thankfully. At that time, I thought, oh, man, that's just ridiculous. But someone else thought that was a good idea. Um, so there, the system is set up if it's from what they consider the top properties within MGM, then a positive, one or two positive evaluations from there, and that's probably, or definitely it needs two. Two from a top property is good enough for table games to decide they'll take action based on that information. If it's from what they consider circus not a circus. top property, yeah, <laughs> although Circus Circus is no longer with us, I don't think. Yeah. But uh, with MGM, us. Uh, anyways, if it's from a lower Rainbow property, Passes was with MGM for a long time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, if it came from them, they probably want at least one positive in addition to however many they've received at the other places from you know, uh, one of the top properties to say, okay, we'll consider taking action against this person. Do casinos care about non-profitable card counters the learning counters we're still doing things painfully slowly this does not play a winning game but they are counting cards it depends on who takes a look there are some to a lot that are just going to you know your card counter we're going to get you and that's end of story there are some that uh Laugh as the player takes one chip from one pile, moves it to the plus pile, takes one away from the plus pile, moves it back to the neutral pile, and then to the minus pile. Uh, we'll shake our heads and say, okay, you know, just get a little bit better, and uh, man, we'll pay attention then. In fact, I had one. Uh, ben Affleck did that at the Hard Rock and got busted for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had one that I had decided. He was timid, wasn't spreading enough. He was pretty close, uh, didn't take advantage of the best deviations, um, made a few mistakes other than that. And I said, okay, you know what, I'm going to let this guy float. So I floated him, and uh, someone else came in after me, gave him a positive survey, and I thought, there's no way the survey came back positive on this guy. You know, not, not to this big of an and ran through it. Sure enough, it did. Uh, we, had, oh, we had someone else here. Now, anyways, I've lost uh, my train of thought on that one. It depends on the person who's who's running you down, whether or not they want to go after it or not. And uh, generally, oh, here's the other story. We had one, that, uh, I was at Aria, and someone came over from Cosmo, called up to the room, said that guy on whatever table, blackjack table, is on. We, we just gave him a positive. Said, you know what, I was, I was pretty close too as well. Said, but he just busted out, and he's betting light to medium black he just busted out he went over the box table and now he's betting five ten thousand dollars a hand so i'm not doing anything with him i'm gonna let him go 
loses more on that bot game than you know he does from the mental exercise he enjoys counting down a blackjack table. So I didn't do anything with that person. And that was that was a guy that could probably beat us, you know, for for a small amount. But what he could beat us for, he was giving away five times that on Bach or us. Let him play Bach. Yeah, I I often wonder about. You know, a, a guy that may be counting, but his wife is losing, you know, three times what he's winning on slots, and they go back him off and, you know, well, shoot themselves in the foot. And a lot of people enjoy the, the mental exercise of it. You know, the the little challenge of keeping track of the count, of adjusting for running count, trying to remember the deviations, all while doing it, while chatting with the dealer and everything else going on. You want a lot of smart people. Who are coming in, especially the higher end players who own their own businesses and whatever else they've done in life, eventually they're going to pick up this is card counting. Yeah. And maybe they're not out to get you. Maybe it's just the mental exercise. Maybe it's just fun for them. Maybe they, you know, it's how they relax. But then they're going to bet three, four times as much on craps and they're going to go over and they're going to play some you know, high limit slots as well on top of that. Whether it's worth the bar of that person because. He's taking a little bit back off a of blackjack. I don't know. That's not never been my decision, but people do learn it. Do players splitting tens is that an automatic red flag to either being a card counter or a whole carter or an idiot? Oh uh, yeah, there's a uh, um, someone I should attribute this to. Only idiots and advantage players split tens. Someone coined that phrase, and I wish I knew who to attribute that to, but I don't know where it started. Um, but yeah, you split tens, you're, you're going to get, okay, what's the deal? And uh, it, it just stands out. It's something that doesn't happen. You double down on a blackjack, you're going to get a weird look. Um, Do you get called if that if somebody splits tens? Does that trigger an automatic phone call or not? Not really. You start hitting seventeen versus a ten. That, that'll that'll trigger the weird play call. This person's playing weird. Splitting tens actually happens a decent amount of time if you're watching the six to five tables. The basic strategy is so atrocious over there, but it's it's fairly common in those games. So is hitting seventeen versus ten. So is doubling twelve versus two or three. These strange plays that people come up with. Mm-hmm. See how successful they are. You know, if if it's got anything to do with next card, whole card, anything like that, you give them a few extra minutes that you wouldn't have given them if they hadn't have split the tens or hadn't have hit the seventeen versus a ten. I won't say seventeen versus an ace because that's the correct play in some places. But seventeen versus a ten, you generally just stand. One of the questioners said that they've heard that MGM properties have a system when a known AP or otherwise flag player uses their player's card on property or checks into a room, then an alert gets get, gets generated, such as a be on the lookout for. Now, if you use your card for comps, no alert that I know of. If you're scheduled to check into the room and have given the name, then you're on your flag for whatever reason. That will send something out. These are the people set to arrive that are on our flag list. If you insert it into a slot machine, we do have the uh, software. If we've decided to add you into there, we have to add the person manually into, hey, we want to know when this person uses their card into the slot machine. Um, We don't have an alert for immediately being rated on table games as of yet. Places I've worked at had it. Um, so just simply using the card in a restaurant, using your comps in a gift shop or something like that, no alert that I know of. How many of the black chip or larger bettors have you seen who are skilled at handling chips, either shuffling, stacking, counting quickly and elegantly, etc., hitting at many hours of experience, but who are not APs? No. Oh, tons. All the um, poker players. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Lots of them can shuffle checks. It's just a habit. I would say 99 out of 100 people who could shuffle checks are probably not an advantage player. Now, a guy who can roll checks across his fingers and other little advanced tricks, he's had some more time. Doesn't mean he's an advantage player, but he's definitely, you know, Practice a little bit more with checks. Shuffling checks is not a big tell. It's everybody does it. Anybody who spent any amount of time gambling, they just they just like the the feel of shuffling it. Other than slouching, 
What are things you see APs do that draw heat that could have been easily avoided? Um, who? There are actually a few of these. Um, they're all kind of, you have to have the camera on at the time. Uh, arriving at the table, two of you at the same time, and you split the dealer's attention. One goes to first base, one goes to third base. That's immediately going to raise some eyebrows, because why would two buddies not sit next to each other? And then second, you've divided the dealer's attention. She's got to look one direction or the other direction and can't see the whole table anymore. Uh, see, So I, that may be more of an indication of some sort of cheating. Uh, yeah, past the first thing or, I would think is cheating before hole carding. But uh, yeah, especially if you've come in together and then you approach a table and you sit on the opposite sides of the table. This is why. Yeah, that seems pretty stupid. Like, why would you come in together? <laughs> I would say if um, if there happens to be, say, a pit overview up and the back counting, you're loitering in the pit for a while, walking from table to table, watching the play while you have checks in your hand waiting to jump in, that's a pretty big tell. Um, other than that, it, I, I guess possibly a dealer change if you almost get into a fight for a certain chair at the table. That might, uh, <laughs> Is that that might tip somebody off. But... Try and think of more. Those are immediate ones. What about people who get up and go to the bathroom for 20 minutes whenever the dealer change happens? Well, yeah. Yeah, that'll that'll do it, too. If you know, it happens to be a carny game or it happens to be... But I don't know why you would do that. You can simply slow the game down and not give that tell away. Some people just are, <laughs> are don't want not to give very back good anything. at their jobs. You know? yeah. <laughs> they... Well, I could see not wanting to give back anything. Giving back anything is kind of horrible. But... Uh, yeah, but the, same at the time, cost yeah. of ruining the game. Yeah. yeah. Now, you you briefly mentioned it, but this is a question about it. Some players are very good at using a cut card to steal the bottom card steer to, the bottom. to steer the bottom card to themselves or to a team, teammate or even the dealer. Yes. Uh, do you look for that? How often do you find it? No. In all my time, I've only seen one doing specifically that. Um,. And unfortunately, he was slouching and made it completely obvious. And it was easy to catch. And it wasn't even at my place. It was another property of ours. It was a 6-5 to five single deck, which I hadn't worked in a place that built 6-5 to five single deck in quite a while. Um, some other operator caught it. No, there was, there was a slouch giveaway. And then they determined, you know, based on the bet position, whether it was a high card coming to the Confederate or a low card coming to the Confederate, to the best of my knowledge... They didn't cut it to the dealer, but that would seem to be a better option if it's a garbage card on the bottom. Um, the play that would be an improvement upon that, this was this was my enjoyable thing, is cards on their own just randomly get nicked up and dinged rather than cutting the bottom card into play, which is you know, kind of, you got to cut two or three cards off the bottom of the deck. You're cutting a card that's already been marked by someone other than you, and hopefully you don't handle the cards at all, because if they believe that you've marked cards, you'll have a, a good conversation with gaming. But say you don't handle the cards, and you notice that certain cards have certain markings on them, uh, certain ways that the deck is shoved into the peaker, possibly, or the dealer just nicked a card somehow. That was that was my thing. Find what cards were nicked, where I could identify those nicks, and they could be anywhere in the shuffle, uh, and cut those to myself. That's as good as I got, was just to myself. Um, cutting to a confederate was a little more tough, and I didn't spend the amount of time needed to get that down, Pat. I got it down for myself. Um, cutting to the dealer would probably be even a little bit tougher than that. Um, either way, as COVID sidetracked that running experiment, and I was basically just playing with myself anyway. Yeah, playing solo. Um <laughs> Playing solo, no partner, so cutting to myself. We all know what playing with yourself means. You, well, didn't, you didn't have to identify that. <laughs> all right. Very good. Uh, we got a lot of positive comments on you appearing here last time. I suspect we will in the future. Thank you very much, Junior. Oh, thank you both. It's been a blast. At the end of our show, we have a recommended section. Richard, you're up first. Well, since this is the third show we've taped today, I no longer have a recommended, so I do not have a recommended this week. This is this a third tape. Richard is off to a to a secret game, leaving town tomorrow as we tape this, which 
surprised me because he gave two recommended in the one we taped earlier today, which happened to be Arnold Snyder. So I was about to call him, Richard, you know we have another show to do, don't you? But no. <laughs> well, that was it. dumb of me. <laughs> That's, that was my thought. But, um, but I'm much too polite to say that, Richard. My recommended is a old David Baldacci book. It's in uh, 2007. It's called The Winner. It's a, uh, Baldacci, Baldacci writes lots of thrillers in, in their several series. This is a standalone. It's, ca- it's called The Winner, and it deals with uh, people fixing the lottery. And they pick the right people to win them. And the people who win them get lots of money and good things happen. But, of course, in the book, lots of things go wrong. And that's the way a thriller works. It's an interesting story. And it's not related exactly to casino. But lotters are definitely gambling. So I think our listeners will enjoy it. You know what? I just thought of a recommended. Too so, late. No, <laughs> of course. So um, I think it, it, sometime in the past, I recommended... Um, a uh, series called Bosch on Amazon Prime and the books by Michael Conley about this detective uh, named Bosch. And uh, season, season seven has just come out on Amazon Prime and it is the final season. So uh, for people who were fans of that show, uh, check out season seven. I'm, I, I think I started it yesterday and I watched four episodes already. So... Um, yeah, that's my recommendation. Bosch on Amazon Prime. Yeah, and he also, uh, uh, Mike Connolly also does the Lincoln Lawyer series. Right. So uh, it's enjoy if you like police mysteries based in Los Angeles. Thank you very much, Junior. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>